Hey there, Mr. Weaver here, and this is 8th grade module 5, lesson 2, function tables. After this lesson, you need to be able to generate function tables from function rules and use the sets of ordered pairs to graph the functions. Let's learn function tables. A function table is a table that organizes the input and output of a function. You can create a function table from a function rule by substituting appropriate input values into the rule, then simplifying to find the output. An example of a function table is shown. Here we're seeing our function's rule, and with that rule, which is here in the middle, we can go from our input through the rule to get our output, which is our y value. Now, you may have seen these in younger grades with like a function machine, where if you put a number in, then you do whatever the thing says following order of operations and you get a number out. The same thing works in a function table. You take your input, plug it into the rule. So here we substituted it in for x, used order of operations. So one times two is two, add three, we get five. If we plugged in two, we get two times two, which is four, add three, we get seven. So we're just following the rule with order of operations by plugging in our input in order to get our output. This is going to be very useful because when we do this, if we follow the rule, what ends up happening is we can make an ordered pair with our input is our x value and our output, which is our y value. So we end up with a bunch of ordered pairs, x and y, and going from that, we can graph, which we will see in later examples. Example 1. Create function tables. Create a function table for y equals 4x minus 1. Use the input values negative 2, 0, 2, and 4. The input values are substituted for x into the function rule. Simplify the expression to find each output. So here they made a table set up for us. It told us what our input values were, negative 2, 0, 2, and 4. We can see those are all listed right here. We made a row for each input. The rule, they just took our function up here, which was y equals 4x minus 1, and we want to know what y is equal to, so the rule is actually what y was equal to, which is 4x minus 1. We need to do this in order to get y. So that's our rule. When we substitute, we will get our outputs for y. If I input negative 2, I have to follow order of operations, so I would multiply by 4, then subtract 1. Most of the rules that you are going to see are going to multiply first, then add or subtract. Maybe you'll see ones with exponents. If you do, you would do an exponent first, then multiplication. But for now, we'll just multiply and subtract. So negative 2 times 4 is negative 8. 1 less than that is negative 9. If I substitute 0, 0 times 4 is 0, minus 1, negative 1. 2 times 4, 8, minus 1 is 7. 4 times 4, 16, minus 1 is 15. So when I take these inputs here, plug them in through the rule, I get these outputs here. And if we think back to our last lesson, we almost have a mapping diagram by taking our input, going through our rule to get our output. Check your understanding. Complete the function table for y equals negative 4x minus 3. Pause the video now and complete the check. Let's check. Here are your outputs. So the rule you should have been using is minus 4x minus 3. So this is negative 4 times x, then subtract 3. If we multiply a negative times a negative, we end up with positive 4, subtract 3, that's where we get our 1. 1 times negative 4 is negative 4, minus 3 is negative 7. 3 times negative 4 is negative 12, minus 3, negative 15. And 5 times negative 4 is negative 20, minus 3 is negative 23. So again, each time I was plugging in my input, like such, simplifying it out, Whatever I get, that's my output, that's my y. Take time to pause and reflect. How is a function rule represented in a function table? Pause the video now and write down your thoughts. Example 2. Choose appropriate input values. 
It takes approximately 770 peanuts to produce one jar of peanut butter. The total number of peanuts, n, is represented by the function n equals 770p, where p is the number of jars of peanut butter purchased. Determine the appropriate input values for the situation, then complete a function table for n equals 770p. So first in part a, let's determine the appropriate input values. Only whole numbers will make sense for the input here. You don't want decimals or fractions. You're not going to be able to buy a fraction of a jar of peanut butter. And you're also not going to be able to have negative jars of peanut butter. So we, we need our whole numbers, which are our positive counting numbers. So some appropriate values we could use would be like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Those would make sense for the jars of peanut butter. Now let's complete a function table. So if we take our input values, our possible jars of peanut butter, 1, 2, 3, and 4, if we want to know how many peanuts we would need, we can take it and use our rule, which is 770 times p. So if I take my input multiplied by 770, I get my output. So 1 times 770 is 770. 2 times 770 is 1,540. 3 times 770, 2,310. And 4 times 770 would be 3,080. So input to output, I just followed the rule, which was multiply p by 770. There was no add or subtract at the end. This one was just multiplication. Check your understanding, read through the situation, and first determine the appropriate input values that would make sense for the situation, and then complete a function table for the rule given. Pause the video now and complete the check. Check your answer. First, in part A, in this situation, we would need to use whole numbers. So if we look at what is happening, they're charging per photo. We're not going to have parts of photos. P is the what we need for our input for our rule. C would be our output, and we can see that down here. We have to be able to have whole photos. So the only thing that makes sense is whole numbers. Decimals don't make sense. Rational numbers, again, include fractions and decimals. That doesn't make sense. Irrational numbers doesn't make sense either. Those are usually messy decimals or not perfect square roots. Integers might make a little more sense than these others, but we don't want negative photos. So whole numbers really is the only one that makes sense. Then if we're completing our function table, if we buy one photo, so one for P, we would multiply that by 15 cents. So it would be 15 cents, still plus 2.99. So we would get $3.14. If I plug in two, now I have 30 cents for the photos plus 299. I end up with 329. Three, 45 cents for photos plus 299, 344. Four, 60 cents for the photos plus 299, 359. And if you notice, thinking back to what we learned about in module four, notice as we go up by one in our input, our output is going up by 15 cents going up again by 15 cents. Hopefully you can use this to check. As we can see, that's our slope there in our equation, which is our unit rate or rate of change. Our output should be changing by this amount. So that can be a helpful check to make sure you're doing stuff correctly. Let's learn graph functions. The graph of a function is the set of ordered pairs consisting of an input and the corresponding output that make the equation representing the function true. A linear function is a function in which the graph of the solutions form a straight line. Therefore, an equation of the form y equals mx or y equals mx plus b, those are linear functions. We saw those in module 4. We have our direct variation equation and our slope intercept form for our equation. Those are what are called linear equations or linear functions. Here we have the function y equals x minus 1 represented as a table, as ordered pairs, and as a graph. If we look here, we're seeing our function table first. Here's our input. We can plug in 0, 1, 2, and 3. If we plug in each of these values following the rule x minus 1, we get our outputs, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. From this function table, we can then make coordinates or ordered pairs, 0, negative 1, 
put them together as an ordered pair. We can see those down here. Here's one, zero, two, one, three, two. Once we have our ordered pairs, then we can plot them. We have zero, negative one right there. One, zero is right there. Two and one and three, two. All of these relate together. So a function with a rule, we can make a table, then ordered pairs, and then turn that into a graph. Take time to pause and reflect. Compare and contrast each of the different representations of a linear function. There was an equation, a table, graphs, and ordered pairs. Pause the video now and write down your thoughts. Example three, graph linear functions. Create a function table for the function y equals x plus two, then graph the function. So first let's create a function table. Here they made one for us. We wanna select appropriate input values. Since we have this as our rule, it doesn't necessarily matter what they are, but whole numbers are generally gonna be easier when we're graphing, which is our end goal. So let's pick some fairly easy numbers, zero, one, two, and three. If we plug them into our rule, which is just take x, add two, then we can get our outputs. So if I plug in zero, zero plus two is two. If I plug in one, one plus two is three. Two plus two, four, three plus two, five. I took my input, added two, got my output. Now that I have my input and my output, I can create the ordered pair that I can then graph. So input of zero was an output of two. An input of one was an output of three. Two was four and three was five. Next, let's graph the function. So we have our ordered pairs. We want to graph them and we can see what this function then would look like. So zero, two, zero over, two up, one, three. So one for X, three for Y, two for X, four for Y, and three for X, five for Y. So I have my four graphed and then I would want to draw a line that passes through all of them. If I were to keep going, it would actually go through there and there. So I'm gonna kind of try to incorporate those points as well. And it looks like it goes through the corner of each box. So I'm gonna do the best as I can. For functions, we wanna draw little arrowheads at the end to show it would keep going. If I chose an input value of say 10, I could predict that the output value based on the rule of add two would be 12. So I could have a point up here if the graph allowed me to keep going. The line is important because that is the complete graph for the function. Any point on that line is a solution. It would make the rule true. So like even if I picked a point in between here, so like let's say 2.3, this must be 4.3 because I should have just added two. So anything on this line, we should find that that rule works. Check your understanding. Create a function table for the function y equals negative 3x plus 4. Then graph the function. Pause the video now and complete the check. Check your answer. So first, creating a function table. If we plug in each of these values, here's what we get out. Zero is the easiest. Zero times negative three is zero. Plus four gives us four. One, negative three plus four is that. If you notice, again, as I pointed out in a previous example, our rate of change here is going down three each time, which is good because that was our slope of our equation that we learned about in module four. Now let's graph this. So I have my coordinate negative one, seven. So negative one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven would be up here. Zero, four, so zero over, four up. One over, one up. Two over and down two. There's my points. I'm not quite done yet. I do need to connect these with a straight line as best as possible. So that would go in that direction. And there would be my linear function. Hopefully you can use a straight edge to make it more of a straight line. And again, the meaning of the line is that represents that any point on the line will work in the rule if you test out what that coordinate was. So let's say I tested out 0 0.5. If I plugged in 0 0.5, half of negative three is negative one and a half, plus four would be two and a half. If I look, is it two and a half up? 
Yes, it is. So I can use the line to help find any numbers that work. 